All right, welcome uh, everyone here and everyone on YouTube to the Data Science Learning Community uh, Book Club for R for Data Science. This is cohort 10 and we are discussing chapter 26 on iteration. Um, this chapter is very different from the first edition of this chapter because the across function did not exist for the first edition of this chapter. And this chapter is basically a chapter about across and then some other things, but a lot of it's about across. Um, and like across is probably, I don't know, two, three years old now, but to me, it's like, oh, it's this new function that I don't know how to use. And so this was really useful because it's really awesome. And actually even more so the where function, I like had heard of it, but I hadn't really used it. And that's a very useful function. Um, and so, our learning objectives here are to modify multiple columns using the same pattern, uh, to filter based on the contents of multiple columns um, with, you know, again, using patterns to process multiple files and to write multiple files. And really it's to learn how to do all these things repeatedly, which is iteration. Um, I don't, yeah, okay. I do have a little bit of an intro to iteration. So inter iteration is repeatedly performing the same action on different objects. So R is actually full of this like hidden inter iteration. We've talked about it with ggplot2, with facet wrap or facet grid. Uh, they mentioned this in the book. Um, every time you do that, you're making like the same plot for each of a different set of data. And so that's iteration. Um, group by and summarize, when you do those together, you're doing the same functions on each group. So you're iterating across all the groups. Um, when we unnest wider and unnest longer, we are doing like the same code on each element of a column that is a list. And so those were iteration as well. And really like all of our, because we have uh, these functions, vectorized functions, like you can take a vector one to 10 and add one, and in other languages, that would be loops with iteration. And in R, we can just do that. And so we have like built-in iteration. Um, and so like a lot of other languages, you know, chapter two would have been how to do for loops and iteration or, you know, it's pretty early on. And we don't really do that because it's just there. We don't have to think about it as much. Um, but there are obviously other cases where we do need to think about it. And that's what this chapter is about. And actually uh, the next chapter on base R is where we get into some of the other iteration that used to be in these slides. So we'll see that uh, next week. All right. So the first case that we're going to look at is uh, this across function. Um, set up for this, I just am creating a table that has three columns of random numbers. Um, and so I just wanted to set this up so we can see it's just three columns, random numbers in those columns. Nothing super uh, interesting, but we're going to do some some actions on it. In the book, they had four columns, but it fits better with three in the slides. And that's the only reason for that difference. Um, and so, you know, they showed that, let's say you want to do the same thing to a bunch of columns like we have here. Uh, to each of these ABC columns, we want to take the median for a summarized step, for example. We can copy paste. Um, I think that's part of why he had four, or he or she, whoever wrote this chapter, had four examples, because it gets to be more of a pain if you have to copy paste uh, to make four copies or five copies, or you know, depending on the table that you're working with, it could be a hundred copies that you're trying to do. And what if you as we're going to see, you realize, oh, I want to actually add an argument onto this. Then you have to copy paste and update all those different things. So it'd be nice if we could somehow just do the same thing to each of those columns. And that's what across is all about. Um, so across is uh, in dplyr. Um, I called it out with the colons just so that we can know that this came from dplyr. You give it. Um, the columns you want to operate on, and then one or more functions that you want to do to those columns. And so here we want to do operate on all of the columns A through C, and we want to do the uh, apply the median function to them. And we can see I, it it was really messy to actually print the um, tibbles, but you can, you can see that the one that I did manually and the one that I did with the cross are exactly the same thing. That's what this is telling us with this identical. Um, 
And so that's the basics. Like that is that function. And it, it just makes it so much easier. I have had so many cases where I want to do this, where I have a whole bunch of columns and I want to, uh, you know, they are actually like integers. And so I want to say, just turn those into integers or maybe they're date columns. I want to like convert all of these columns to dates. Um, across makes that so super easy. Um, some other things we can do for selecting. So there's the everything function that will get all of the columns except the ones that are like used for grouping because you don't want to apply these things to the ones that you're using as your grouping columns. Um, and then there's this where function, which is really cool. Uh, you can select based on like um, a function that you apply to the co the contents of the column. So if you do where is numeric, it'll find any column where that is true, where the column is numeric or is character, finds all the character columns. Uh, you can combine this with like starts with A and not numeric to find all the columns that start with the letter A but aren't numeric, the contents are not numeric. And I don't think they actually showed, but the this function that you give to where can be anything that evaluates to true or false. So um, I said here, this is the shorthand formation or shorthand um, uh, uh, format for functions. Just think of the slash here as the word function and otherwise it acts as a normal function definition. So this is a function where you take X, which would be the input column. And if I say any, um, if, if in any uh, element of that column, I detect the word name, then this would evaluate as true. And so this finds all columns that contain the word name in at least one of their values. And that's just an example of the kind of thing you can do with where. Um, so like I said, this is really cool. Like you could do um, where, uh, and then do a stringer thing that it looks like a date. So if, if all of them look like a date, you say all stringer have this format, then apply as date. Um, that lets you do all kinds of really cool things. And I think I'm actually going to write some tools for Tidy Tuesday cleaning based on across and where to just like automatically apply a bunch of things on data sets. So um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Uh, one thing to point out in these, this is a very common mistake for this sort of thing, is that you are passing the function to a cross, not a call to the function. So you want to give the name. You don't want to put the parentheses on it. Um, it's really like it's, um, you know, you're probably really used to putting those parentheses uh, for a function. And so it happens a lot. I think um, our studio is pretty good at, at, well, the error messages you get uh, actually, he showed one, and it can be really confusing of what it's referring to because it's you're getting the error from mean, and mean doesn't necessarily have that nice of error messages. Um, and so uh, just make sure that you're passing in the actual function, the name of the function, or the definition of the function, like we saw with uh, slash. Two questions. Um, sure. I don't know if they're coming up in the following slide, but. How do you deal with the arguments from that function? So in this case, with mean, let's Coming up. say drop an eight. <laughs> That's uh, I think probably the next slide. Wow. And do you have, does the other question wait as well? The other one was what happens when you wrote your function before and you want to put that here in the cross? That your you just, you, you can just use your, the name that you gave that function and put that here. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, if your function is named my function, you just put my function. Right. Yeah. All right. So if we want to do arguments, nope, we're not to arguments yet, but we'll do that next. Uh, you can also pass multiple functions and it'll apply each of these functions to each of these values. So we can see we're getting a1, a2, b1, b2, c1, c2. And this would be the mean of a, the median of a, sorry mean of B, median of B, mean of C, median of C. And you probably don't want to just say one and two. And so you can also pass names in. So uh, I'm sorry, it's a little confusing because I was trying to keep this condensed. I put the across AC up in the same line as summarize and just wanted to stress the these are the functions. And so we can say mean equals mean, median equals median. And now it takes that name 
and puts it into the column name. So A mean, A median, B mean, B median, et cetera. All right. Um, I'm sad because I'm, I need to get everything converted to Quarto. I'm used to having a preview in the speaker view. I can't remember what my next slide is. So let's find out. All right. So this is uh, this is the first example with args. All right. So if we take those mean and median, if you want to give it args, the way they recommend doing it is using that anonymous function. So again, you can use the word function here, but as of R4 or 4.1, you can use just a slash for the word function. And then pass in like a new definition of a function is what you're really doing here. So you're saying, this is my function that takes X and it's gonna take the mean of X with NARM equals true. Uh, and I've got another function that takes the median of X with NARM equals true. And that's how I'm gonna pass in arguments to the functions. I think technically across still has dots. So you can pass it, these in as just named arguments, but they recommend not doing that because it makes it really confusing. Actually, you, you, I don't think you can do that because of the, yeah, because it can accept multiple functions that would break, you know, which argument goes to which function. Um, so they have you do this as you pass in this function um, that defines it. And if it gets really complicated in the way that you need to pass in arguments and it's got lots of different arguments or you wanna do multiple functions, at that point, probably just create a function outside of the across and then pass in that function. Um, so yeah, did that answer it? Does that make sense? I have one question there because in the case of, uh, so this is what you would use if you have your own function and it also has more than one uh, input, then yeah. you would also use this. But what you're saying is, if you are going to have multiple inputs or if it's getting messy, you better create another function call to. Yeah. Maybe so with the cross, you're, it has to be a, uh, just a one argument, like you're only going to pass one argument in. So you can't say across, I don't think they have across two yet, which would be interesting where you could pass like two different arguments into the function. So if you're trying to pass two different columns in, you can't do that with across. We'll see how to do that with per in a minute. Um, but yeah, if you have other arguments like constant arguments where you want to say the okay, same okay. thing for everything, um, then yeah, this is how you would do that to, you okay. know, no, no matter how many arguments it would be. Um, and again, it's just for readability like these are simple one line functions. We didn't even have to use the curly braces because it doesn't break onto another line. But okay. if you want to do something more complicated, a lot of times you'll want to put that outside of the pipe just so it's easier to read. Um, if it fits, you know, it can be in the pipe and, and no matter how complicated it is, it technically can be inside of your call here. But I just find it a lot cleaner to put like real function definitions where I don't do the shorthand and I, you know, specify all the arguments and everything uh, outside of the this call before this call, basically, if it's going to be complicated. Okay. All right. Let's see what's next. <laughs> oh, for the names, technically, it is taking a glue specification specification as the dot names argument to across. So you can say whatever you want. I, I just did a simple so. By default, it is doing column underscore function name as the, the name of the new column. I just reversed that and said function underscore of underscore column. And so the dot fn refers to the name of the function. Dot col will always refer to the name of the column. And so here the names become mean of a, median of a, mean of b, median of b, because that's how I specified it with this glue syntax, which we had seen, but, I, you know, I don't know how well everyone has that memorized. It's just you put things, you wrap things in curly braces and anything inside of curly braces is a variable that then gets substituted in. Um, and so here, the again, the dot fn is this name and dot call is like this name or this name uh, and that substitutes in. All right. Um, Technically, you can use a cross in filter, but it gets confusing uh, of what that exactly means. And so they've made these wrapper functions, if any and if all. Um, and it's 
basically the same idea. So you can say if any out of everything, so this is I'm, you know, everything means all the columns uh, is NA. And so that is saying, get rid of any column that has any NAs in it. Um, or sorry, that keep any column that has any N NAs in it. And so that's what this is doing, if any, versus uh, this one down here, if all, I'm saying across all the columns, uh, find things that are not, or do not have any NAs. And so across all the column, uh, the value is not NA. And the only one that, that it applies to is uh, this one row that we can see the like the middle row doesn't have any NAs in it. But again, you can do anything for this function here, anything that evaluates to either true or false. Um, and so, you know, is NA is evaluating to either true or false for each of the columns. Uh, each of the, like in this case, it's not the whole column, it's just like the that row um, that you're trying to select based on because it's filter. Um, Um, the next thing to look at, they show how to use a cross in functions. They, um, do show, and I don't remember if I have a slide showing that you, if you pass in the name of a column to select, so like the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the column specification, you can pass that in, in the function argument and you just have to wrap it in double curly braces when you use it inside of the function. Um, I didn't go into that because you can dig into the book if you want to do that kind of thing. But I wanted to make an example of, um, again, working towards something that I'm probably going to start implementing for Tidy Tuesday data sets to quickly, uh, like this is just a baseline, but to summarize what is in a data set. Um, and so what this does is I have an across for every numeric column, I find the mean uh, I, I guess I just did the mean, but you know I could imagine finding the mean, the median, and like the minimum and the maximum, or something like that, um, and putting that in uh, as column or as something that we're going to summarize. But that doesn't make sense for factors and characters, and so I have where is factor or where is character. I want to find how many distinct values does that have, and so is it something that only has three values, or is it something that has like a thousand different values? And then I am also inside of this function applying a glimpse just because it made it look neater when I uh, finished the result. And again, I can imagine um, I, I am probably going to implement something along these lines for Tidy Tuesday so that I can just get a quick idea of what's going on with data sets when I'm trying to clean them up. And so if we look at what this does, we take the MPG data set um, for the numeric Columns, dispel, year, sill, city, and highway, it's finding the means. But for the factor or character columns, it's telling me how many different values uh, does it have. I could imagine setting up a whole set of these of what do I want to know about a data set when I'm just first looking at it? I'm actually kind of surprised. I don't know. I don't know. I guess different people have different things they want, but I don't know of anything that just does that, gives you a nice, clean, I mean, I guess summary in base R does a little bit, but not, you know, you can't customize what it says. And so um, that's the idea here is, but you can use just, you know, you can just put a cross into the function to, to work with it that way. Uh, another example is here, diamonds is different. And so you have more means and fewer of the and distinct, but it still is giving us a little bit of an example of how that works. One quick um, question. Yep. Imagine if one of your uh, column is not numeric or character or I don't know. Right, know right now it wouldn't show up at all. Um, so okay. like if I have a date column, it's just not here right now. Uh, again, yeah. that's why it's not done yet, but I could imagine doing something like this. So like um, probably something like where not and then and all the other types that I have covered, if it's not covered, then tell me just the name of the column or something, you know, like tell me something about it or what is the class? So what's the leftover piece? Um, I can imagine setting that up. Again, summary does do a lot of this, but you can't customize summary so easily. And so that's that's the idea here. So you can 
make your own summarization of a data set. Or maybe get the classes first and then yeah, and then iterate so over them depending on what they are. Which are. <laughs> yeah, um, that was, I actually did include what is the class of each column at first, but it was just hard to see on the screen. And so I left that out, but you know, you could have, um, I think I had an across everything uh, class. And so like cl uh, list class equals class and, or, or sorry. And it wasn't just class because I wanted to get just the first class uh, because classes, you can have multiple classes on something and that would get messy. Um, and so you can have it just tell you the, like the most unique class uh, for the data set or for the, the column rather. Lots of other things you could do. And I, again, I think I'm going to set something like this up for when I am just exploring a data set. Um, I say for Tidy Tuesday, but also just for work things. You know, if you're just like getting to know a data set, it can be really helpful to do some kind of standard, um, infer, you know, just not even analysis really, but just, just give me a nice quick summary uh, that has things that I care about that aren't necessarily what summary gives. All right, so that's those two. Um, and then the next thing that uh, we went over and I mostly just like threw in slides, this is not perfect yet, but I wanted to make sure that we covered map. Um, map is, now it's the old way to iterate. This chapter was basically all about map back in uh, the old days because they a cross didn't exist. Um, but there are still a lot of cases where you want to do map. What map does is you take give it a, a list or any other vector, and it'll apply the same function to each element of that list. And so the example that they went through is, you know, we can list all the files in a given directory with a given pattern or whatever to, to get a list of files. Um, you can set the names of those. That's what the set names function is doing with base name. And so that is giving taking this list of files and taking just the um, file name, the end of it, making it be the name of that list. And now we have a named list that we can pass into map and we're gonna read Excel on each of those files. So everything that's XLSX, we're gonna read Excel. Um, and then they show, okay, then we can take that uh, data frame that results uh, for each one of those data frames that results, we could do some sort of fix. Um, I, I abbreviated here because who knows what it will be, but like maybe you want to only select certain columns or you want to, oh, sometimes they have a weird column and I want to convert that to so that's the same as all the other data frames or whatever you want to do that you can do to each one of those. You can do that however many times you want. So you can do different maps in a pipe. And then finally at the end, uh, the recommended way to do that is now we have a list of data frames and we can um, use this list R bind function, list row bind that will take all the data frames and try to stick them together. Um, this names to argument is you can create a new column. So these all, all the way through have had the name, which is the file name. And so we're gonna actually formally make that a column in the final data frame where they're all combined. Um, I smashed a bunch into this one slide. And so uh, if you have questions or comments, that is absolutely fine. <laughs> um, and again, I don't remember. I looked at this earlier, but I don't remember what my next slide is. So we'll see how much detail we go into. Oh, yeah. So they had a sentence or a paragraph, I guess. We recommend this approach where we perform each step on each file instead of combining it all into a function to apply on each file. Um, because it stops you getting fixated on getting the first file right before moving on to the rest. By considering all of the data when doing tidying and cleaning, you're more likely to think holistically and end up with a higher quality result. I wanted to talk about this a little bit because I almost always do one or two files, get it working, and then like get it working good enough and then iterate and see what else there is. Because... I don't know, like it's overwhelming to try to get all the files to work and it might be slow and like you might hit just weird walls because you aren't even reading the file right in the first place. And so I almost always like I'll do this, um, but like even maybe here before here, 
put a head one into my pipe and just get it working for that one file. And then uh, once it's working, you know, it might not be perfect for that one file, but once it's kind of working for that one file, maybe change that to head two, make sure it works for two files. You know, especially if you've got like a thousand files you're trying to read or something. I just, I don't agree <laughs> with this approach. I would almost never start with everything. Um, I do understand like sometimes you'll get it working for one file and then you load the second file and find out that the first file is almost nothing like it. And you know, you wasted time or whatever. <sighs> so don't get it perfect <laughs> for the one file, but get it yeah, kind of working. Um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out because I thought that was uh, interesting how much I disagree with their approach. I think um, this, I've always wondered about this. I don't know if this is the right moment to discuss it, this or not, but I've always wondered how people divide let's say they're working on a project on how do they divide it into different scripts or documents in general because for me it's like um stages of the project if i'm gonna clean the data i usually do that in one script and i don't know if that's correct or not if i'm gonna then do a model then i do the modeling part the implementation of the model with the cleaned data that i already did in one script that's another script and then the graphs another script so I don't know if that's the right way or not. I so several. Yeah, it depends what I'm working on. I theoretically I like working in uh an R markdown or quarto file most of the time and doing like it's not that I'm working on data cleaning cleaning because no one actually cares about data cleaning. I'm working on whatever the project, you know, the report is and then that might reference a script that's data cleaning if it doesn't matter like if no one would would want to see that code then yeah i would put that over into a different file but i would like call that in in the midst of a document of some sort now i say it you know like that's my aspirational way a lot of times i end up just working in some script and going oh nope i need another script now and oh this is messy i'm gonna split this up and um and so I guess to directly answer it, I think in the end, I end up kind of like what you're saying, of like you have a script that is the data cleaning, if there is one clean step of data cleaning. Um, but yeah, it depends a little bit on what I'm working on. I also work in package, like inside of a package a lot of the time. And so then it ends up being um, one script does, or one file is like one function or one family of functions. Um, and then I have a, um, like vignette that I'll be working in. That is like the report or whatever. Um, there are lots of different ways to do that, but no matter what, uh, like I'll start with one usually, well, say, the reason I say one or two, because sometimes things break if it's just one file, like it, it will act differently when it has just one file it's reading than if it has two, um, or if like, if it, you know, a one row tibble sometimes will behave differently than a two row tibble um, because mm -hmm. you're only getting one result back for different things. Um, and so a lot of times I do try to keep two <laughs> instead of one. Um, but even, you know, if it's like pretty involved cleaning, I'll uh, do the, the basics enough that it doesn't break on the first file and then see if that also works on the second file. Um, and then <laughs> once I've got it, just once I have it working on two, then maybe I'll go right to, okay, and now I'll do a thousand or, you know, <laughs> do them all. Um, but yeah, I don't want to load it all. That's all I've been working. Like I download my data from the API here or API here, and then I clean yeah. it here in another script and then so on and so forth. Yeah. I also remember you saying something about trying to keep your script with less than a number of oh. rows, a number of <laughs> well, that, functions. So that's not a, a oh. script per se, but I try to keep each function. Uh, it's not formally five. The book that this comes from is called Five Lines of Code. And it's about like, you want to be able to just read. It, it needs to be kind of a thought in a function is at least the idea. And if it's more than that, you just make another function that the first function calls and you just keep breaking down that way. But that second function ha has to have a clear name 
So you don't actually have to go look at the code of the function unless you want to see how it's done is the idea. So that you can just read, oh, this function says, you know, clean data. Oh, that's the function that cleans the data. I don't care how you clean the data. I will just accept that. Or if I do care how to do it, if you're in our studio, you can put your cursor on the name of the function and hit F2. It'll jump to the definition of the function wherever it is in your project. And so, yeah, F2 is the best. How many lines Sorry. did you think? Five? Five. Yep. Oh, God. Yep. Oh, it is God. really funny because I'll look at some of my own code before I started, before I read that book. And it's, oh, I never used to do five lines of code for sure. But um, I don't, I, I, I don't think, <laughs> I think five is very, very, very restrictive. But uh, the, the other, the other sort of rule I've heard about is at least try to have it a function on a page so on the screen yep. so instead yep. of of limiting to five at least that you can see the whole function on the screen which i all still don't always do because sometimes i say okay but i think this i don't <laughs> like, know yeah. i i don't feel like creating a, another one but at least i can uh i can live with 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 a, with a rule for a screen and the, the other topic, what we were talking about of one files or everything, I'm not sure because sometimes I, when, when I when I'm working as I'm, I mean, I would I was reading a, a bunch of files and I was happy, and then boom, I get an, an error because whatever because one something is missing in one of the files. So maybe if I working on making it work on the file that's correct, and then I find an, a, a function or ID that works for that file that's perfect, then when I get to the file that's not perfect, then I will have to reward. So I rather have that add up first. And uh, I, so, so, yeah. I Like, I don't disagree, but I, I want to have that error soon, but not necessarily first. Like, no, I, I want to so, know yeah. that that... Yeah, that yeah, that file yeah, is yeah, yeah. different. And so that's why I say do like one or two files and don't get them perfect. I, I guess I don't say that here, but do one yeah. or two and get them, you know, that yeah, that, that mostly works. And then do it for a, a bunch of other for files. Bunch, and then exactly. Yeah. yeah find yeah. what doesn't work and you know, maybe expand. It, it depends how many total files you have to work with. Um I I should probably do like a screencast sometime of doing a tidy Tuesday data set because the final script that I put into the repository of oh this is how i clean the data that's what i do is i like do this iteration on it and then at the end i like delete everything i've done or not everything i've downloaded and do it from start to finish make sure that the script can run through straight through but as i'm figuring out what to do i don't run the script straight through i might find oh i should have like I, I didn't download this piece of data and I need that. And so I'll go back and earlier in the script, download that piece of data. Um, and then again, like delete everything that I've downloaded and make sure it runs through straight through from beginning to end. So the final code I, I create doesn't look like I did this. You know, you don't see this in the code that I end up with um, because I have been changing things as I go. And at the end, I delete the line where I say, you know, head. And and instead, I take all of the lines. Um. So, yeah, I, I, you know, it depends what you're doing. I guess you know, formally, it would be good to keep all of that data about the kind of development of the script. But I don't know anyone who really uh, does that. You end up deleting things you don't use most of the time. It's not like we're doing a lab book, lab notebook here. Although some people might be. So <laughs> maybe you do want to keep all that. Anyway, I just thought that was a really interesting uh, couple of sentences. And like leading up to it, I was like, oh, this is weird the way they're putting this together. And they said, yeah, it is. Like, this is something we intentionally do. Um, oh, and the other thing they didn't show here is, um, you know, like depending what you're doing, a lot of times you can put this earlier in the, like before these functions, and then you can just do everything on all the, like, all of the tables stuck together at once. But if you have to do something to make this step work, that's where you would want to do it before you do the R bind. Um, and that's where it becomes the difference between having to do some weird map thing versus you can just mutate. 
at, you know, like all of them are coming in as strings that could be treated as dates or different things like that. Um, so you'll have to kind of watch where you put this R bind step. Um, but it is like uh, a lot of times it is easier to work with lists of data frames um, as long as you can and then bind them together at the end um, rather than like putting things together and then, oh, but out of those only that one file's worth of rows had the broken values in this. And now I have to refine those to, to apply a mutate to just those rows or whatever. Uh, and so that's where doing these separate maps can be useful. Um, and then I think this is probably the, the last slide I have here that there's also walk in per. Walk is for things where you aren't looking for, uh, to, you know, you're not trying to produce a data frame or a list or something. You are just trying to do something. Uh, it's called, you're trying to do, uh, get side effects. That's what that's formally uh, called. And he talks about that in, in a star. But it, like, if you want to save a bunch of plots or save a bunch of CSV files, that kind of thing, that would be most often walk. Although um, a lot of those functions are still going to have some sort of output. Uh, maybe it's going to be the path where you save it or it'll be different things like that. And in that case, maybe you do want to map so that you can capture all those outputs and make sure that it's doing uh, what you think it is doing. So walk is just basically map, except you throw away whatever result comes out or you don't care about whatever result it is other than outside of R, what the result is. Um, there's also map to and walk to. Uh, that is uh, where it takes two inputs. And then pmap and pwalk, and I don't think they mentioned this in this chapter, um, but these take a list as their first input, and then the function can use, uh, you know, is is it can use up to all of the things in the list. The reason that that matters is that technically a data frame is a list of vectors, a list of columns, and so a data frame counts as a list for that. You can just give the data frame to pmap or to pwalk, and then each of the columns is a different argument to whatever function you pass in. These used to be super, super, super useful. And now across does most of what they did. So um, it still can be useful. And I, I have cases in my own code where I still would use pwalk and pmap um, if I wanted to call those out. And then I realized I don't have anything about, there's also variants of map, all the map functions, or if you want, uh, if you're just doing map two or map, the output will be a list. If you want, if all of the output are um, character, then you can do map underscore chr, and then it'll make a character vector instead of a list. We can do map underscore int, map underscore lgl for logical, map underscore dbl for double. Um, map, well, then they used to have map underscore dfr for uh, data frame row, but they recommend now just do map and then do the list R bind at the end instead of doing the DFR uh, where you make it a data frame at each step or where you bind it together, sorry, at each step. And yep, that is that chapter. Um, I did, you know, like I said, I, I uh, condensed the first stuff uh, or not really condensed it, but I didn't have really super clean slides on those. But the slide deck, when I came to it, um, wasn't for this chapter. <laughs> I'm not sure what the cohort nine did, but it was all for and like while stuff and that's in the next chapter. So, um, and they had some, I think they had some per stuff, but it wasn't across based. So I, I suspected slides were made before the update, um, which was a while ago. Anyway. So, so yeah. I take it like her replaces or loops yes well oh, largely like largely not uh, you, there are still times when you need to do for loops um but for the most part per is um for where you want to do something or do the same thing over and over uh for loops you still need if you want to um well in some cases where you want to kind of like 
not do different thing or the same thing to a bunch of different inputs, but where you want to uh, keep kind of looping through and maybe accumulating or something or that kind of thing, except per actually also has as an accumulate function, it has a reduce function, all these other things that are for special kinds of for loops. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit about that next week. And then there's a lot about that in advanced R. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you'll see more of that, the, the other things you can do with per. Um, it is like per, the reason it's called that is uh, there is um, a concept, it, like a computer science concept of functional programming, which R is mostly based around functional programming. And uh, per was originally for pure functional programming in R. So it was pure R. And I think he didn't like pure sounded kind of weird and gross. And so he dropped the E and turned it into per. Um, it's not I, it, yeah. Oh. And so it just, it makes your code per. It's, it makes it fast and, and nice and whatever. So. Um, you purr too. So. Yeah. And it makes you happy. Uh, but it was funny. I was like, uh, I, I like to go through the GitHub repos of uh, packages and go back as far as you can in the history to see, you know, what was this uh, when it first started? And you can see conversations mm -hmm. like that if you dig in far enough. Most of the time, sometimes they have moved it to a new repository and like gotten rid of the history. Um, and it's sad when that happens, but. <laughs> but our historian. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I find it interesting finding things like it is P, uh, per with three R's because then it was the same length as tidy R and um, what's it? Dplyr. Dplyr, yeah. And a couple other functions, like it had the same number of characters. And so all of the library calls at the top of your uh, script would be the same length. And he liked that those lined up nicely. Symmetry. Um, yes. <laughs> it's just funny to see things like that and learn a little bit about you know, Hadley's uh, particular, you know, you can get a little bit of his personality from, but it's nice because it lines up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's the word. Um, I think there's a word for that. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of like to learn all those little bits of history or trivia that you always, every time you give it either a talk or one of your book clubs, <laughs> you always give those away. And I love it. I love it. I don't remember them all, but I, but I make a note of, of the ones that I do. Well, I'm remember. glad you appreciate it because I love it too. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and type end in this chat and I will see everyone.